So it's no secret that the Warhammer 40k universe is home to some seriously over the top factions and characters, and each somehow manages to be even more ridiculous than the last. But just how powerful are they exactly? And which one is the strongest and who's the weakest? Well, join me on a journey as we rank all of the notable factions within the 40k universe from bad to best. And a quick side note before we get started, a lot of these factions are actually allies with one another, but personally I figured it'd be a lot more fun to break them down where it makes sense. And additionally, in interest of making this video not a hundred hours long, I'm not going to be listing out literally every single guard regiment, because honest to god we would be here all day. And more importantly, I think it would kind of paint an incomplete picture of what this universe actually looks like. But don't worry, I'm going to throw a few curveballs in there that you might not see coming. Okay, let's get started. In the number 20 slot, we have the Exodite Eldar. And we're kicking this thing off with a faction that most people don't actually know about. As the Exodites aren't really represented in the tabletop game at all, and only appear in a handful of novels. You see, the Exodite Eldar are a group of primal space elves that literally ride dinosaurs into battle. And honestly, it's just as ridiculous and awesome as it sounds. You see, their race abandoned the Eldar Empire during its peak. They saw the path the Eldari were on and decided to bail before things got worse. Which honestly, in retrospect, was a solid choice. You see, at this point in time, the Eldari Empire had descended into complete hedonism and debauchery. Pleasure cults had taken over their governmental systems, and the combined psychic energy of millions of Eldar getting weird was about to summon a literal chaos god. Now, This obviously wasn't known at the time, but something bad was definitely coming. So the Exodites exodited themselves, and the planets they would eventually settle were primal and untouched. They basically became like the Amish of the Eldar, choosing to forsake their great technological advancements and pursue an honest life. They wanted to live like their ancient ancestors and work with their hands once again, to plow the fields and tame the lands. Now, The idea of actually doing physical labor is abhorrent to the Eldar. So they were definitely seen as radicals. But despite the sneers of their cousins, they were honestly successful, and now control several worlds across the stars and commune with what is known as the World Spirit, a system much like the Craft Worlders Infinity Circuits, where they're able to plug in the souls of the dead, and their ancestors are able to flow freely through their society, offering wisdom and guidance. Now, they're not completely without technology, as they did maintain a pretty large armory of Eldari weaponry in order to defend their worlds from invaders. But construction equipment or artificial intelligence or, you know, pretty much anything that would make our lives easier? Nah, we don't need anything like that. We're gonna plow the lands like our forefathers did. But give up our shuriken cannons? Well, that's not gonna happen. Which to be fair, honestly makes a lot of sense. The universe can be an incredibly dangerous place. And nowadays they ride into battle upon massive titanic dinosaur-like creatures, bristling with pulse weapons. Now this is an army that is not represented in Warhammer very often, and one of the best depictions we get of them is in the opening battle of a novel called The Infinite and the Divine, as they fend off a Necron invasion. But hopefully that will change in the future, because space elves riding dinosaurs is something I definitely need in my life. At number 19 we have the Harlequins. So the Eldar Space Clowns are one of the most truly bizarre armies in all of 40k. They're protectors of an ancient craft world known as the Black Library that's buried deep in the webway, and they seem to be able to accurately predict the future. Not to mention they cultishly worship one of the few remaining Eldar gods, Chegarak, the Laughing God. And what's really interesting about them is they kinda act like emissaries for all of the different Eldar factions. They're able to freely travel through their societies and owe no allegiance to the craft worlds, the Dark Eldar, or even the Exodites. And even though most of the Eldari look at them as kind of bizarre and weird for obvious reasons, they do tend to command a pretty large amount of respect. One of their craziest feats of strength is the ability to appear in any portion of the galaxy at any time. Those that they are in pursuit of never being able to shake them no matter what they do. And although to their prey, this may seem like a series of beings that can materialize anywhere they want, it's more likely due to their mastery of the webway. It is said that the Harlequins have somehow mapped out all of its infinite corridors. Now we actually see a really interesting example of this in the Fabius Bile trilogy, where he is constantly hounded by a particular Harlequin troop that just won't leave him alone. You see, the Harlequins see themselves as actors, and the galaxy as their stage. Every single one of them, and for that matter, every unique individual in the galaxy, has a certain role to play in this grand performance. Now, Fabulous Bill here in this example was known to them as the King of Feathers, and throughout the story, they just seem like they're harassing him, giving him cryptic messages and appearing seemingly out of nowhere at every major location on his journey. However, the truth of the matter is far more calculating than their lackadaisy appearance will make you think. 
They apparently had been goading him into certain acts and performances throughout his trip, making sure he was exactly where he was supposed to be at every moment. The Harlequins are an enigma wrapped in a mystery. Fortune tellers, acrobats, and deadly warriors, all wrapped up in bright and flashy clothing. And although a smaller force than most major players in the galaxy, their bizarre, esoteric weaponry makes them incredibly dangerous foes to fight against. Now, one such example is the Harlequin's Kiss, which is literally an arm-mounted stabbing device that injects the victim with hundreds of feet of razor wire, and then turns their insides into a giant meat blender before being violently ripped back out. Needless to say, you don't want to get these guys' attention. In the number 18 slot, we have the Gene Stealer Cult. Now, personally, I feel like the children of the Star Gods don't get nearly enough credit, as they're one of the most underrated and underappreciated factions in all of 40k. They're often portrayed as little more than the cultists of the Tyranids, a harbinger of a far more powerful faction. And this isn't necessarily untrue, as the Tyranids are potentially one of the strongest forces in all of 40k. However, the Gene Stealer cult represents something far more insidious than just brute force. You see, they're the enemy within. Now, Gene Stealer cults are a group of humans that have been infected by a parasitic monster known as a Gene Stealer. He starts off by snatching people off the street and brainwashing them into worshiping him. He does this by injecting his victims with a portion of his own DNA. Now, the brainwashed individuals will no longer see him as some grotesque monster, but instead, he appears as a messiah figure that warns of a coming apocalypse. His followers are then sent out to bring more people to be infected, and slowly the righteous and terrible flock grows just under the surface. Now, eventually the cult will reach a tipping point where it has grown large enough and has infected and infiltrated every layer of society. At this point, a great uprising will occur and the planet will be plunged into anarchy and war. Now, in many instances, this uprising signals the arrival of a Tyranid Hive Fleet that will descend upon the confused world and consume every living thing upon it, including the cultists themselves. Now, other times, the cult will embed themselves in trade fleets and flotillas and spread their corrupting influence across the stars. Now, the most horrifying thing about the Gene Stealer cult is they could literally be anywhere. They look like you and me and would have no way of knowing who's infected and who isn't. It is believed that thousands of worlds currently have cults growing on them with no way of being rooted out until it's too late. Now, just recently, a Gene Stealer cult was discovered on Holy Terra itself, the most defended human world in the entire galaxy. Now, if the cult hadn't been discovered and was allowed to fester for several hundred more years, the resulting revolution may have been catastrophic. And yes, they were unsuccessful as the Inquisition did discover them before they were fully able to prepare. But the fact that this seemingly lesser faction was able to infiltrate the literally most important planet in the entire Imperium is a really big deal. Now, the major weakness of the Gene Stealer cult is kind of obvious, but it's that they're a portion of the Tyranid as a whole. They are incredibly insidious and their uprisings immensely destructive, but without the star gods they worship, they are mostly scavengers. Now, it's true that their individuals can infiltrate high-ranking military positions and take control of entire fleets. But compared to the overwhelming might of the Imperial Navy and the Astra Militarum, this is a very small portion of its forces that will turn traitor. And in a full-scale war, the cultists would not be able to stand up to the crushing might of the Imperium. But again, this isn't really what they're all about. It isn't how they fight. They're far more duplicitous than that. The Gene Stealer cult is contempt to spread its influence across the stars and to wriggle its way into the minds of the Imperial citizens, one by one, rather than declaring all-out war. At number 17, we have the Chaos and Imperial Knights. So there's this common phenomena in Warhammer 40K where they take something seemingly mundane and kick it up to 11. And the knights are no different, as they're literally futuristic space knights, but instead of riding horses, these guys pilot massive war engines instead, each one bristling with some truly impressive firepower, not to mention literal metric tons of armor. They stand between 40 and 55 feet tall and are truly ancient, originating in the dark age of technology. Each one is a holy or demonic relic, depending on which side of the Eye of Terror the knight finds himself. Some choose to operate as a lone hunter, under the moniker of Dreadblade for Chaos and Freeblades for the Imperium, while others deploy in full household regalia, an entire regiment of knights taking to the battlefield to decimate all that would stand in their way. Firing fist-sized shells as they charge into battle, engines roaring with the fires and bloodlusts of war, each capable of laying down enough firepower to level an entire battlefield by themselves, while still kicking around tanks and crushing any infantry that get too close. Now, despite the hundreds of different knight households, you can honestly think of them in two major distinct categories. There's the Imperial and Chaos Knights. The former group, 
A noble royalty that rule over neo-feudalistic worlds, sworn to the protection of mankind and to uphold the proud traditions of their households. The other, a twisted and demonic version of the former, once proud warriors corrupted by the dark gods and set on a selfish pursuit of power above all else, fueled by a seething hatred for the Imperium. Now, each of the knights is a massive mech controlled by a single pilot. The knight Scion, as they're known, is able to interface with their knight and basically control it with their thoughts. These are massive towering war engines and destruction incarnate. Being in the path of a single knight, let alone an entire detachment of them, is a horrifying concept. They are one of the most powerful war machines at the Imperium's disposal. Knights can be equipped with a wide variety of devastating weaponry, including massive Volkite combustors, laser destroyers, or enormous missile racks, just to name a few. And this honestly makes them some truly horrifying combatants. In number 16, we have the Yanari. So the biggest weakness of the Eldar as a faction is that they're all unbelievably pompous and arrogant. And for lack of better words, they're really far up their own ass. If they were ever able to put aside their differences and become fully unified, it would be a major problem for the Imperium. Well, that's kind of sort of what the Yanari are. You see, they're a cult of Eldar who worship the Eldar god of death, Yanid. They believe that if they acquire all five legendary weapons known as Crone Swords, then they'll be able to fully resurrect their deity. And supposedly this guy will be strong enough to beat the god of excess Slanesh. And through this, the Eldar Empire will be fully unified once again and brought back to its former glory. Now the Yanari are seen as a cult by other Eldar and are tolerated by some and hated by others. But despite the fact that they're a group of Eldar who literally run around worshiping the god of death, a lot of the Eldari from different factions have defected to join them and have chosen to follow the guidance of the Emissary of Yanid, Yavrain. And side note, I am probably butchering these names as words are hard in general for me, and when you throw Eldar words in the mix, it's, it's, it's a whole situation. But anyways, this is a fighting force that combines the strength of all within the Eldar Empire. The Dark Eldar Truekin fight beside the Craftworlders, Harlequins, Exodites, and even Corsairs charge into battle side by side to put down any that would deny the superiority of the Eldar race. Now, one of the greatest weaknesses of the Eldar Empire is that they're kind of in a fractured state, and an individual that's able to unite them under a common goal is a powerful person that should be feared and respected. Now, the Yonori have been incredibly influential in many battles in recent times, and Yvrain, alongside Belisarius Call, even assisted in the resurrection of Gilliman. Now, to be fair, it's kind of difficult to quantify their exact power level, as the Yonori haven't really been around for very long. They're pretty new in the grand scheme of the 40k universe, so time will tell just how powerful they end up becoming, and what impact they'll have on the universe as a whole. At number 15, we have the Dark Mechanicum. So the Dark Mechanicum is an army of techno-magi that are responsible for the creation of the various demon engines found throughout the forces of chaos. Now this is a portion of the Adeptus Mechanicus that split off during the Martian Civil War. They have pursued dark arcane secrets that the Emperor had previously banned. Their technology has no limit and they are able to create anything their twisted souls can come up with, meaning they are able to literally bond demons to their machines, something that the Adeptus Mechanicus would see as the highest form of tech heresy. Now, their individual creations on a whole are traditionally stronger than their Imperial counterparts. However, Forge Worlds within the Eye of Terror are incredibly rare, and the resources used to create these things are even rarer. Raids into real space are one of the only truly viable ways of gathering the necessary resources to produce new war engines. They control far less Forge Worlds than their Imperial cousins and must rely more heavily on the powers of the Dark Gods. The loss of a single Titan for the Imperium is a massive blow, as creating another one can take many generations. But for the Dark Mechanicum, it's a hundred times worse. Now that being said, their creations they are able to produce are truly monstrous in design and purpose. They are living war machines and powered by the furious ambition of the Dark Gods. When fusing a demon to their creations, the bound demon is able to fully inhabit the mechanical monstrosity. And over time, metal components are replaced with living organs, intestinal tracts that funnel rounds of hate-filled ammunition through the machine and out through the barrels of its guns, each snapping with living maws that drool Prometheum and hunger for destruction. They are unbound by the limitations of the physical universe, and no feat of engineering is considered forbidden. Year after year, they come up with ever more horrifying creations, and the scariest part of all is we probably have yet to see just how twisted their designs can become. In the 14th slot, we have the Inquisition, but we're gonna go ahead and break them up into their three main militant branches. So we're actually gonna give the 14th slot to the Death Watch. So the Inquisition is a massive organization, and they're broken up into what are known as Ordos. Each Ordo focuses on a different enemy of mankind. Ordo Xenos focuses on aliens in all of their forms. 
So the most powerful force within the militant division of Ordo Xenos is the Death Watch. And the Death Watch are pretty unique space marines, as they're made up of individuals all coming from different chapters, each a veteran of a hundred battles. You see, the Death Watch specializes in the eradication of aliens, and these guys have had a lot of practice in the subject matter. There is no one better when it comes to fighting orcs, Eldar, Tyranids, you name it. Anything that is considered an alien, the Death Watch specializes in. Now, to a Space Marine veteran, being chosen to join the Death Watch is considered a great honor, as only the most elite of Space Marines are chosen for such a task. It is known as the Long Vigil, and after serving within the Death Watch for a specified amount of time, the Marine will be allowed to return to his chapter once more. And although he's allowed to bring his experience back to his battle brothers in order to help them in future engagements, he must forever keep the secrets of the Death Watch hidden. An interesting tradition of those who have served as part of the Death Watch is to keep the Shoulder Pauldron when they return to their Legion. And honestly, this makes a lot of sense because if I had to serve within the Death Watch, I would definitely keep that Shoulder Pauldron. They probably have to see a lot of really horrifying stuff. Now, here's the thing about the Death Watch that makes them different from a normal chapter. They're not a massive fighting force that grinds their enemy into dust. You see, Death Watch members operate in much smaller groups known as kill teams. You can think of them as like a spec op version of the Space Marines, a small handful of elite warriors that move in to accomplish an objective quickly and efficiently. And although innovation is traditionally frowned upon within the Imperium, especially by members of the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Death Watch frankly don't care. They're constantly fine-tuning their weapons and armor to be more efficient at killing. When you're facing a foe like the Tyranids that is constantly able to adapt to your tactics and evolve itself in such a way that it's basically a completely different enemy every time you fight them, the Death Watch needs to be just as flexible. Now, they're famous for using a wide variety of different types of ammunition, each with a different purpose. Now, whether the rounds be filled with bioacid or cause their target to burst into flames on impact, or like my personal favorite round, the turbo penetrator rounds, puncture even the most powerful of force fields. Now, needless to say, the Death Watch is the bane of aliens everywhere. They're a really interesting and versatile chapter and definitely deserve this place on the list. In the number 13 slot, we have the Sisters of Battle. So much like with the Death Watch, the Sisters of Battle are the militant division of the Adeptus Sororitas, an entirely female organization often nicknamed the Nuns with Guns or the Space Nuns. Now these ladies are unbelievably badass. Now at their core, they're regular humans just like the members of the Astra Militarum, but they're also clad in power armor much like their male counterparts, the Space Marines. They tend to have a propensity for heavy weapons and normally run with an enormous amount of multi-meltas, flamethrowers, and all manner of devastating firepower. However, the sisters believe that their faith is the strongest weapon of all as each one of them is completely dedicated to the worship of the God Emperor. They are vessels of his holy wrath incarnate, used to enact the divine will of all those that would deny his godship. And although this sounds like wishful thinking, their faith does actually have a tendency to manifest into very literal miracles, such as wounds miraculously healing, or even in one instance, enormous flaming eagles made entirely of the Emperor's own psychic energy manifesting in the skies to rain fire down upon the sisters' foes. Now, personally, I've read a couple of different conflicting origin stories for the sisters, but the most well-known one is that they exist through a loophole. You see, the church was seen as getting too powerful, so it was declared that they could have no men under arms. Now, emphasis on the men part, because yeah, that backfired pretty hard. You can think of the sisters of battle as the militant division of the Adeptus Sororitas, which is part of Ordo Hereticus. And they're basically a group of witch hunters. They are sworn to hunt down the heretic and the witch no matter where they happen to appear. And aside from their wide array of ridiculously heavy firepower, they actually utilize a lot of really bizarre creations as well, such as the Penitent Engine, which for lack of better words is basically a crucifixion dreadnought. These disturbing machines have a sinner that desires redemption strapped to the front of them. They're given no armor or any form of frontal protection, and then loaded up with a series of battle stems to keep them alive no matter how grievous their injuries. But very importantly, they're not given anything to dull their pain as pain is seen as part of the path to redemption. And the idea is that they'll receive absolution through great butchery. Now, it is believed that the divine protection of the emperor is the only armor that the sinner needs. And if they are truly worthy of redemption, then the emperor's hand will guide them and protect them. Now, on one hand, this is really stupid. But on the other hand, it's the most metal thing I've ever read about. And if I'm being honest, the Sisters of Battle would probably have made it up higher on the list. The only problem is that they're basically a sub-faction within a sub-faction within a sub-faction of the Imperium. So despite how strong they actually are, it's really difficult to compare them to much larger factions. 
In the number 12 slot, we have another Inquisition faction, the Grey Knights. Now, I think it's fair to say that the Grey Knights are the most powerful Space Marines ever created. They are the Sigilite's secret legion, crafted specifically to fight the Arch Enemy. They are Space Marine demon hunters, who not only are incredibly skilled warriors, but each one of them is a master psyker. They are a brotherhood of sorcerers sworn to hunt and eradicate demons wherever they appear. Their existence is so secret that most of the Space Marines don't even know they exist, well, with the exception of the Chapter Masters and the Space Wolves. Now, unlike the other legions who get their gene seed from their respective Primarch, the gene seed of the Grey Knights comes directly from the Emperor himself. They are the militant arm of Ordo Malleus, a branch of the Inquisition that is entirely focused around demons and demonology. Now, if you were to ever see a Grey Knight in the wild, that means your planet is seriously messed up. For them to make their presence known means that a heretical cult of demon summoners, or something far, far worse, has embedded itself nearby. Those that encounter the Grey Knights or even end up fighting beside them are unfortunately killed by the Inquisition or have their memories completely erased. Now, this is to keep their existence completely secret. These guys are so pure that it is said that they are incorruptible. Not one Grey Knight in the history of their order has ever fallen to the temptations of the Dark Gods. Now, the trials an aspirant needs to undergo to become a Space Marine are notoriously dangerous, the survival rate being something like 1 in 100 or even 1 in 1,000 in some cases. Now, the Grey Knights take this a step further, as they must pass 666 rituals of detestation, designed to break even the strongest of fully-fledged Space Marines, one of which literally requires the individual to become possessed by a demon. If the aspirant is not able to excise it from themselves, then they will be destroyed. Now, if the initiate is successful, then they'll have their minds wiped of the experience and initiated into the Grey Knights. In the number 11 slot, we have the Drukhari. Now, during the fall of the Eldar, the survivors split off into multiple paths. The Drukhari are also known as the Dark Eldar and are very similar to the depraved and hedonistic Eldar from thousands of years ago. They have refused to abandon the old ways and view themselves as the only true Eldari, the true kin, as they call themselves. They are a race of savage and sadistic pirates and raiders, descending upon unsuspecting worlds in the dead of night to prey on the weak. They are ruthless and barbaric and literally feed off the suffering of other sentient species, like some form of psychic vampire. Now, in the Dark Eldar's defense, they do this as a means of survival as the Chaos God Slanesh is constantly hungering after their souls, and literally draining their life force every minute of every day. By feeding on pain and suffering, they're able to rejuvenate themselves and stave off the advances of Slanesh for a period of time. And although this may sound a little sympathetic, don't get it twisted. They truly enjoy what they do. Nothing brings them greater joy than the pain of others. Their weapons are designed to inflict as much suffering as possible. They are twisted and evil creations that fire neurotoxin-coated crystal shards or even concentrated dark matter. So the bulk of the Drukhari military is made up of what are known as Kabbalite warriors, each one a ruthless and sadistic killing machine, and as close as you'll get to a trained soldier within the Dark Eldar forces. Now accompanying them into battle are the gladiatorial witch cults, acrobatic melee combatants that utilize speed and finesse, and not to mention a whole host of bizarre melee weapons to dazzle and confuse their opponents. Additionally, the homunculi covens bring to war twisted abominations. The homunculi are mad scientists, and their creations make for some truly devastating shock troops. Now, one of the major weaknesses of the Dark Eldar is their size. Now, the entire species exists in a single city known as Kimura, which is buried deep in a parallel dimension known as the Webway. And although it's a single city, it's impossible to gauge just how large it truly is. Some reports claim that it is planet-sized, while other accounts from individuals who have actually been there say that it goes on for infinity. It is an impossible place that is somehow larger on the inside. And the deeper you go, the more the laws of physics begin to break down. Now, regardless of its true size, they do not control any form of footprint on the galactic map and exist primarily as a raiding faction. Now, don't let that fool you. The Dark Eldar are incredibly dangerous and not to mention intuitive and make for some pretty awful enemies to fight. If it wasn't for their lack of numbers, they probably would have made it higher up on the list as their technology is so advanced, it is seen as techno sorcery by humanity. And thus concludes part one of the top 20 factions in 40K. If your favorite faction didn't appear on this list, then that probably is a good indication that they're gonna be in the top 10. I normally wouldn't care how long the video is and I would just kind of go on for an hour if, if I had to, but this video, when I first started it, it was not intended to be a super long thing and I just kind of got carried away and kept on writing. So for my own sanity, I'm gonna take a little bit of a break and let my voice rest because if you couldn't tell, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather today. And part two should be up pretty soon. So thank you very much for hanging out with me, you guys, and I'll see you in the next part. 
where we're going to get into all of the big boys of 40K. 